Good morning. Hope you're doing all right this morning. Having a good week so far because it just started. So maybe let's get it started on the right track this morning. Take your Bibles and turn them to the book of Ruth this morning. Ruth chapter 3. Had a great light night last night as we um, had our living room reset with Kurt Cameron here. Had a great crowd at it. It was just a, an incredible evening. I want to thank those of you that came and those of you that brought people and the many that served in that event um, as we just provided something through, through that organization to, to reach and touch the city of Charlotte in some special ways. Also, this past Tuesday night, we launched and kicked off our 301, our Church at 301 service. Uh, Tuesday night, had a good crowd at that. And that's part of our weekly rhythm as we try to do something new and something different. You're welcome to come check it out sometime and uh, just be praying for that service as we, as we seek to move forward um, in, in trying to reach this next generation for Christ. So several years ago, one of the things, by the way, about me that you don't need to know, it's really not that important, but I love to get gifts. I just, I love to get gifts. I also love to give gifts. It's kind of that love language thing. I, I, it's one of those things I just really enjoy. It means a lot to me, all that kind of stuff. I'm not asking you to get me a gift. I mean, you're welcome to, but I'm not asking you uh, to do that. But several years ago, someone uh, randomly and anonymously put a gift in my office on a Sunday morning. And I uh, came back to my office, and, and there was this gift. I opened it up, and it was really simple but really meaningful gift. It just, it just touched my heart. It was just something I needed that day, I guess, and, and it was an absolute blessing. A couple weeks later, same thing happened again. There I come back, and it's on my desk, this, this gift, and, or a different gift. And I opened it up, and I'm like, well, this is really, really sweet. I also got a little nervous, like, who's giving me gifts and won't tell me. A couple weeks later, there was a, a note with a, a, a kind word of encouragement it, and the handwriting was the same as what was written on the gift, but, but no name. Well, this kind of continued on for, for, for several months. And so I, I, I needed to find out who this person that was giving this gift. I mean, no, number one, like I could be totally ignoring this person on a Sunday morning, like walking by him, giving him the cold shoulder, not talking to him or stuff like that. And this person's just reaching out and being compassionate and kind. And it was so encouraging. So, so I, I approached my, my, my assistant and I said, hey, listen, do you know who's who's doing this? And she nodded her head. And I said, who? Tell me. I can't tell you. They don't want you to know. And I said, is it you? To which she said, no, I work for you. (laughs) I'm not giving you a gift. And so one of the things also you can know about me is that I'm, I think I'm pretty good at getting information and getting secrets from people. That's probably not a spiritual gift or anything like that. But so I began to, 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 to just try to get this information and it took me several weeks, but finally my assistant cracked and gave me enough hint to where I figured out who it was. And I, and I was, I was shocked by that. So the weeks after, without saying anything and allowing everything to remain remain anonymous, I began to kind of make sure to make contact with this person on the weekends and and drop them a note here and there of encouragement and stuff like that and and really began to to find more information about this person, have conversations, stop and get to know them. Come to find out it wasn't just that they were giving gifts, they were an incredibly sweet, kind person that deeply loved our family. And what a blessing it was not the gifts, but the giver. Through, through the book of Ruth and through the story of this, this young widow's life, she has received a great deal of kindness and gifts. Her life has been absolutely blessed by the end of chapter 2 by a generous, kind gentleman by the name of Boaz. But in chapter 3, the burner turns up Everything begins to shift and pivot as Ruth is led on a journey, a really unique journey, to seek not just the gift, but the giver. And as the story comes and as the story goes throughout the rest of this book, Ruth and Boaz form an incredible relationship that leads to marriage. And I want to show you this morning kind of how that began and how Ruth went from just seeking the gift and enjoying the gift and moving to seeking the giver. So draw your attention to chapter 1, and if you would stand in honor of God's word, we'll begin reading in verse verse 1. 
Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. And then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek for you that, that it may be, seek rest for you that it may be well with you? It's not, it's not Boaz, our relative, with whom, whose young women you, you were. See now, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Why don't you go wash and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor? But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. You can be seated. There's a few things happening here that aren't spoken but are really important to understand. And the one is, is the most obvious, or it's going to become obvious as we, as we read on in the next few verses in the weeks ahead, is that Ruth, what Naomi is telling Ruth to do, and what Naomi does and how it's perceived, is she is proposing marriage to Boaz. So that's taking place. All these activities that are happening here, this odd instruction is really a marriage proposal from Ruth, a widow, to Boaz, an elder single man. So that's what happens. And as the story goes, they, they do end up getting married and having children and so on and so forth. They live happily ever after and so forth. So that's taking place. And that's really important to understand and know. But I don't want you to cheat and read ahead. So I'm just going to tell you. Um, but another thing that's happening here is... is an Old Testament law, two actually Old Testament laws intersecting here in, in this proposal and in the verses that we just read. One of those is, is called the law of the leveret. You've probably never heard of the law of leveret unless you've studied Old Testament law. It, it's derived from the word lever, which is a Latin word that translates the Hebrew word brother-in-law. And the law is basically this. It's read, in fact, in fact, we'll just draw our attention there. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, 25, this law appears. And actually, this is the only time that we see this law actually practiced in the Old Testament. And, and, and in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, here's the law. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name not, may not be blotted out of Israel. So the law of the leather, the law of the brother-in-law was basically that if, if your brother passed away and the widow that he leaves behind has not had children it is your obligation it is your duty as a brother-in-law as a brother to your brother to take that widow as your wife to have a child with her and the firstborn child of that marriage will bear the name of the deceased brother so that that brother's name and the family name from that will continue on. You see, the family, the Israelite family was important to God. And so he put steps and measure, laws together to preserve the name of a family. And so that was the law of the Leverite. The, the other law that, that intersects with this one that's mentioned is the law of kinsman redeemer. Now, in chapter 2, Naomi just drops a hint and drops a word that Boaz happens to be a relative and one of their redeemers. Now, we won't go into the details of this law necessarily because it was a pretty broad law and it covered a lot of different things. Leviticus tells us quite a bit about it in Leviticus chapter 25, specifically 27. But this law was, was basically instituted not just for the carrying on of a name, but also carrying on of, of livelihood, freedom, and land. 
which also God had given to his people. He had set his people free. He had given them the promised land. But as times would progress and things would get difficult, there could be moments and times that a person would have to sell their land or they would, they would basically get into debt, their land's taken away, or they would come into a difficult situation where they would have to sell themselves possibly even into slavery. And the idea behind this law was that the nearest kinsman to that person had the first opportunity to redeem that piece of land or even that family that had to be sold into slavery back in to the family so that the people, the tribes, the families, and specifically the land would remain in Israel. And we see both of these laws being enacted and being called upon right here in this story. It's important to God that the family name of his people continues on, and it's important to God that the land continues to people. Now, that, 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 those laws were, were spread out broadly. In fact, so broadly that technically in Ruth chapter 3, this law did not apply to neither Ruth nor Boaz. Neither of these laws did. Ruth, though, yes, she was a widow, and yes, she did marry an Israelite. She was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. And so she had every right. That's why in, in chapter 1, Naomi releases them, her two widowed daughter-in-laws, and says, listen, you go back to your families, meaning, meaning I, I, I've got nothing for you. I, I don't have any more sons, and so this whole law of the lever, it's not going to work for you. You're going to have to wait 20-so years for me to have more sons who are then obligated to marry you and give you children. So you are released from this law, so forth. They weren't bound by that law. Ruth is not required to do that, which shows incredible kindness by Ruth. Because very likely, when Ruth links herself to Naomi, it means she may never be married again. Her commitment to Naomi is so deep. And it also shows great kindness from Naomi, who then turns around and says, listen, I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to help you find, find a husband. But it also applies to Boaz, or the law doesn't also apply to Boaz, because Boaz it was not the nearest redeemer or nearest kinsman. Though he is a family member, as we see in the next few stories, uh, as the story goes on, that he's not the closest one, and he's certainly not a brother or brother-in-law. So he's not obligated by any of this to do anything with this. He's really not even obligated to show kindness in the way that he has and care for them in the way he has, which also tells you that there may have been something more beyond just absolute grace and kindness in Boaz's heart towards Ruth, which Naomi, as mothers do, picked up on it. And so we see incredible kindness from these two people in character, care for God's heart, care for God's nature, is the undertone and the thrust of what is happening in this story, to follow these laws that they're not even required to follow, but to use the thrust of them to care for one another. Another thing is we need to look at and understand here that we probably don't understand as much because, well, we're city people, is this whole idea of threshing floor and this winnowing barley, this what was taking place at the scene of what had happened. So the harvest is done, and after the harvest was done, the the grain would be dried out and then it would be winnowed. And the idea of that is that all the chaff and all the dust and, and all the dirt, and, and it, we, we would, they would go through this cleansing process to where there would simply be nothing but the grain so they could move forward with that. And so they would have everything stored up. They would have it being dried out. And then they would have this process where they would clean this out. It's called winnowing. And it was done on the threshing floor. Now, Likely, the threshing floor was somewhere in a kind of a hilly area where there's a rocky surface because you didn't want a lot of dirt and you needed wind because what they would do is they would throw the grain up in the air and the, the shaft and the dirt and the dust would all blow off and the grain would fall back down and it would be clean. And they would go through that process through the wind. So it needed to be a rocky surface and it needed to be a windy surface. And it happened to be, as we can see, this is taking place in the evening. It happened to be that the windiest time, the, great, the best breeze would have been in the evening hours. So these men would have been working all day and then they would have especially specifically revved up the winnowing towards evening and through the early, early hours of darkness. And then afterwards they would eat, they would camp out there, 
and they would go to sleep, and then they would get up and do it the next day. The reason they would eat out there and camp out there is to protect their harvest. You don't want goats, and you don't want other animals coming through and taking those. You also don't want other thieves coming through and taking them. So, so they, would, they would stay out there, which is unique that Boaz was out there as well because most landowners were wealthy enough not to have to do that, but he's working with his men, and he's out there with his men. So that's what's taking place there. So just think about this for a minute. You got a group of men who are really happy this year because it was a great harvest. And every time they're winnowing, they're thinking, money, 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 money. I mean, it's a great thing. This is lots of joy, lots of excitement. It's dark, they're tired, they eat, they drink. They have some happy, happy hearts. Group of men at dark, laid down, and Naomi sends her attractive, beautiful, single daughter-in-law into that. This whole scene is strange. I'm going to be honest with you. As a dad, I'm not doing this. I will never say to my daughter, hey, there's a group of men over there. Wait till they get really happy, all by themselves, secluded, alone, in the woods or on a hill, in the cover of darkness, get dressed really nice, put on some perfume, and go to them, and then uncover one of their feet. I, this, is just, this is just unique. This is one of the reminders that not everything in the Bible is prescriptive, okay? Because in our modern day time, this would, this would be very dangerous advice, but the truth is it's not just in our modern time. This was a very risky proposal plan. It was risky on several levels. One, it's just risky in the situation that that Naomi or Ruth could be going into. She is a single woman. She's told to do something in secrecy, so, so no one else knows she's out there. And Naomi sends her off. It could have been that in the darkness of night as she's traveling to there, she could be attacked or she could be pulled aside. It could be that the men she's going don't read the situation properly, and they look at Ruth as, as a person who's there to meet their needs. I mean, it could have been perceived that Ruth was a prostitute that night. And then there's the risk of under the darkness of night, she says, uh, make, make a note where he lies um, and, and, and keep that in your mind and then go uncover his feet. The reason she said that is because we don't want you uncovering the wrong feet because it may be the wrong person who may have the wrong idea. This is, this is, this is strange. Like she doesn't say, take a gun with you. She doesn't say, take your brother with you. She didn't have a brother. All, it just is just a bizarre situation. And it's also bizarre in the way that it could be perceived. Clearly, we know Ruth to be a woman of character, nobility, modesty, and humility. And here, this could quickly be taken the wrong, wrong way. Dangerous situation. There's a couple saving things here that tell us that Naomi is a mindful mother-in-law and she's just not sending her daughter into a situation where she would be perceived as, as a prostitute. One of those things is she says to only uncover the feet, which by the way, those of you that have ever been around a man's feet at the end of the day, there's nothing seductive about that, okay? But she does make note uncover his feet, not more. There's a sign of humility, lay there at his feet, which is uniquely, we, you may not know this, but the Moabite people exist because some young women approached their father Lot in a similar circumstance, got him drunk and slept with him. This is almost like a redemption of that people by the approach that she's taking here. Further, furthermore, what she does in this process is perceived not as prostitution, as Boaz is awakened and notices and recognizes Ruth, but it's seen as a sign of respectfulness, the way that she waits and the way that she serves 
and the way that she allows him to take control. This is a trust in the character of a godly man and a mother-in-law's trust in the hidden providential hand of God over the situation. And all of this, these laws, this threshing floor, this risk, move a young woman from being just a person that receives gifts to being a person who is after the giver of those gifts. Which, friends, that's exactly how God wants us to seek Him. Not just as one that gives us something, but one that we realize He is the treasure, and He is the gift. And I think thousands of years ago, through this story and through this approach of, to her Redeemer, we see that approach and we can learn a great deal. No longer is Ruth just merely satisfied and no longer is Naomi wanting Ruth to be satisfied with just, just gifts and leftovers, but, but she wants to pursue the one from where they came. She didn't want to just pursue what Boaz had to offer but it was Boaz that she was after. The joy and beauty of Christianity, the joy and beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that we get all of these incredible gifts and oh, the gifts are incredible and oh, the gifts are so undeserved. The gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, the gift of joy and the gift of his presence and the gift of his comfort and all the gifts that we receive, the gift of all the promises of God, which find their yes in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The gifts are wonderful, but listen, the giver is more wonderful. These gifts allow us access and to know the giver. So if we could just in our, our time left together, I want us to think about how Ruth is instructed to approach the giver. Because I think it's how we can really know and approach our giver as well. She gives some instructions in verse 3. These are very practical instructions, and they're also pretty, pretty helpful instructions. This is what she says, verse 3. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. What she basically says is, Ruth, go take a bath. Ruth, put on some perfume and change your clothes to nicer clothes. For those of you who are single this morning, hoping that the Lord will lead you to an opportunity to have a spouse one day, this is really good advice in finding a spouse. Bathe, smell good, and dress nice. Because you're not gonna get one without those minimal things. That's good advice, practical advice. But it's also really good advice in coming to reach and grow closer to our Redeemer. First thing she says is to wash. Now, the Jewish law required ceremonial washing before a special event. And so certainly if the occasion was special, there would be an expectation that you would bathe. Now that may seem like strange instructions, especially for, for, for ladies. Ladies are a whole lot cleaner than men. But this is a long time ago, and this is an Eastern culture, and, and baths were not a regular thing. It wasn't an everyday process. 
Um, they didn't have running water. And so if you wanted to take a bath, it required you to draw the water and, and to take a bath in that manner. So, so especially at a working time like this, when, when the days are full, there, there wasn't time for it necessarily. And so we, we can assume that likely it might have been some time since she was working so hard for both her and her mother-in-law, working so hard, it might have been a time that she had gone maybe a few days with, without a bath. So Ruth, you're going to propose. I'm sending you on a journey well, you're basically dropping the knee and asking this man to marry you. So, so clean up. He's, he's certainly interested. Which, by the way, what a, I, I love, you know, we looked at last week in chapter two, how Naomi's kind of motherhood woke, woke up and here it's full throttle now. One of the things different about the culture as well is that, is that parents chose the spouses for their children. It wasn't the child's choice. It was the parent's choice. And so Naomi kicks in. So she says, Ruth, I, I, I need to seek for your well-being. I need to find you a spouse. And so she says this. I don't know if this is something that was just said in one moment or spread out over time. And so as she does, she, she begins to say, you know, Boaz, he's such a nice man. He's very successful, this Boaz. And Ruth, he's been really kind to you. He's, he's drawn attention to you. you. You know that he's not done this for any, any other women. And oh, by the way, Ruth, you know Boaz? He's, uh, he's a relative of ours and there's laws. And, I mean, she's, she's, she's pushing her daughter-in-law to this direction. And then she just says, all right, enough. We're turning the heat up on this thing and you're going to propose tonight. So bathe, wash. Which is also something that you and I need to understand about seeking our giver. That washing is necessary for a close relationship with him. Listen to what, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Since we have all these gifts, since we have this relationship with this Redeemer, since we have all of these promises that he's given us, you want to seek him, you want to get closer to them, let us wash ourselves. Listen to what the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will, I will not listen because your hands are full of blood. So therefore, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Our Redeemer has forgiven us of sin and set us free from the bondage of sin. The gift of freedom and the gift of forgiveness and salvation. And in that gift, we must continue to follow him in that through obedience and allow this cleansing to take place so we can press into him. We cannot know him more. We cannot press into him more with the sin in our lives. The scripture says in the New Testament and the Old Testament, be holy even as I am holy. This freedom, this forgiveness, these gifts empower us and enable us to do battle on what keeps us filthy. You want to press into God? You want to know him and his will and his way? You want a deep relationship? You've got to work on the sin in your life. You ever pray and just don't feel like your prayers are being answered or you're hearing from God? You ever ask God for something and it just seems like there's silence? Well, I, I've learned in my life a prayer that you can pray that God always immediately answers. There's not a time I've ever prayed this prayer that God didn't answer it. 
You want to try it? Thank you. <laughs> With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm serious. I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to trust me, okay? Trust me. I'm not going to lead you into heresy, okay? Trust me. Here's the prayer. And so you don't have to say it out loud. This is you just talking to God. Ask God to do this for you. Ask God to, to speak to you in this manner within your heart right now. Here it is. Lord, please show me sin in my life that you want gone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. He answered it, didn't he? Holy Spirit of God shows you areas in your life when you seek and you ask that question. There, there, is, there is sin in our lives. Every single one of us. I don't care how religious, how spiritual, how smart, how much Bible you know, until you step foot in heaven, there is sin in your life that keeps you from knowing fully who he is. So let's wash ourselves. Let's let him work on us in those areas of our lives. Wash yourself. She also says to her, anoint yourself, which this could have meant a number of things, but, but given the scenario, it was, a, it was a picture of her putting fragrances on to, to smell nice. It was a special thing. It was, it was done normally for brides and for special purposes, for a special event. Likely it was olive oil that she put in. They didn't have modern perfumes of those days. And, and so she was just simply to, to give an aroma, which would have set her apart from several different people. Number one, it would have set her apart from the sweaty men who were working there on the threshing float. It also would have set her apart from, from possibly prostitutes who may not have been in that same manner and smelled that certain way. Anoint herself. I think it's important to remind ourselves that we, when we came to know the giver and we received the gifts of the giver, the first gift that he gave us is the anointing of his Holy Spirit. That at the moment of salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God in your life. First John chapter 2, verse 20, but, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. Jesus talks about the significance and the importance of anointing. And he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Our access to God right now, our connection with him is his Holy Spirit within us. That God is always at every moment present with us. He is living with us. He has anointed us. But so often we forget that and we don't act upon that and we don't look to that and we don't think about that. In fact, much of what happens in our lives has nothing to do with the power of the Holy Spirit in us. If Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, if even he called for it and wanted it, how much more should we need it and understand how important it is in our lives, in our families, in our home, and in our ministries and churches? The Holy Spirit of God in us, yet so often we don't allow him to work and we neglect him working. Most neglected person of the Trinity. A.W. Tozer said, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what the church is doing and what Christians are doing would go right on. Nobody would know the difference. I wonder how true that is in your life. If the Holy Spirit of God were to disappear right now in your life, what would be different? Really, 
What would be different tomorrow at 8 a.m. when you go to work? What would be different in your daily routine, in your daily life? What would you not see happening that you're seeing happening right now? For that matter, what about our church? If the Holy Spirit of God were to just disappear, what would be different than what's happening right now? I don't have the answer to that question. But I do understand this. You want to press into God. You want to know God. He's given you his spirit, and his spirit is what enables you to do that, and his spirit is what empowers you to do that, and his spirit is what directs that. He has fruit he wants to bring out in you. And some of that fruit is to fight the flesh in you. He's the one that illuminates the word of God for you and directs your path and directs your steps. He is absolutely vital to your spiritual growth. You want to press into this to give her, you got to understand the importance. And give attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Also, she says, change, change clothes. Now, some would look at this and say that she's to dress nicer. I mean, you know, you're going on a date, you're going to propose. So take a bath, put some perfume on, and dress nice, just attractive. But when she describes this in, in the ESV, it translated cloak, which is a great translation of the word simla, is what this is in Hebrew. It's the outer garment that a person would wear. It was a cold night. It was in the evening, and so she would have worn a, an outer garment. And that outer garment for women typically covered virtually the entire body except for the head. In no way is this dress that she's to wear seductive or racy or suggesting anything of the like. In fact, to dress in such a way would have repulsed a godly man like Boaz. So it was a modest, but it was a change. Change your clothes. Which makes us think, what had Ruth been wearing before this? Likely, she had been wearing the clothing of a mourner and that of a widow to signify her grief and her loss and out of respect for her deceased husband. She probably didn't have a large wardrobe and at this point in time in pairing up with her mother-in-law who was also a widow. She probably didn't need a large wardrobe. They're grieving. They're honoring the deaths of their husband by wearing the garments and clothings of those who would be mourning. We know that others wore clothing like this in, in grief and moments. So essentially what Naomi is telling Ruth is, Ruth, it's time to move on. It's time to move the past, the past. God has a future, and that future is winnowing barley tonight on a threshing floor. So let's move on. There's a similar picture of this scene in the life of King David. David made a grave mistake. And as a result of that mistake, the firstborn child of Bathsheba was going to be put to death. And so in those early days of his life, David pleaded with God and begged God to save him. And he mourned and he grieved through that time. And it tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 12 that David came to his servants and said, is the child dead? And they said, yes, he is dead. And then it says this in verse 20. And David rose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. Naomi is telling her to end her period of mourning over her widowhood and move on to what God has for her 
ahead. It was perhaps this very reason that Boaz had, had kept distance and had not suggested any of these things out of respect for her mourning and respect for her grief. And so she says, let's put the past away and move ahead. Now I want you to think about this just to rewind and understand something here. The situation they were in as widows was partly because they left the promised land of God. Elimelech took his family away from the land of Israel, moved to Moab, not only moved to Moab, but allowed his two sons to marry Moabite women. Moabite people didn't serve the one true God. And through all of this, he dies, his sons die, and the result is two widows. Whole situation could be argued was because of the mistake of another person and a mistake maybe even of them. But the redeeming thing of this story, oh, I like this. I need this. The redeeming thing of this story is that God even uses our past and our mistakes for his glory. Ruth never would have turned to the true God had it not been for the son of Naomi marrying a foreign woman, which he was not supposed to do. Naomi wouldn't be back in Bethlehem and being provided that day had it not been for that saved woman, Ruth, redeemed. God even used the past for his glory. Now, this is not a loophole to our rebellion. It is a tribute to the powerful grace and glory of our Savior, Jesus. Stop despairing about your past. We live in so much shame and so much guilt over what mistakes we've made, not realizing that our God can take dead things and make them alive. And just as he can take dead things and make them alive, he can take mistakes and bring goodness out of them. God can take difficult and hard things like grief and loss and the pain and the sin of other people that affects us. Some of you are living bound by the scars of someone else's sin, not even yours. And some of us are living with the shame and the guilt of our sin. And as a result of hanging on to that and beating ourselves up and then letting the church beat us up because we're really good at beating up people that make mistakes. Oh, I am going to preach now because we can be some of the most self-righteous people when in reality behind all of our closets, deep down in our hearts and souls is the most vile of things in all of us that we need just as much as anyone else the shed, cleansing, forgiving blood of Jesus Christ to cover. I don't care how long you've been in church, you've got filth in you. You've got just as much filth in you as a prostitute on the corner or a homosexual person living a lifestyle. Stop pointing the finger and start looking in the mirror as well. And move on. Because hanging on to our sin and hanging on to the mistakes of other people and hanging on to the things that just didn't work out keeps us from experiencing the goodness of God and what he has for us in the future. So change your clothes and walk in the grace of God. His gifts are so, so good. But let me tell you something. He's better than his gifts. So seek the giver, not 
just the gifts. And so this young woman takes a bath, perfumes up, gets dressed, and in verse 5, she said, all that you say, I will do. She goes to the threshing floor to get a husband. It reminds me of that song. I'm going to the threshing floor and I'm gonna get married. You heard that song before? Probably not. And you don't ever need to hear that song again, do you? It's a unique story. But it's real life. And real people. And a really, really good God. Seek him. Let's pray.